Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Today we're taking a look at some SIG pistols. Now in the past, I have done separate reviews on the P365 and the P365 SAS. So I guess you're gonna ask why am I doing them again? Well, the reason I'm doing them again is because I'm looking for a new carry concealed weapon and uh, I'm looking to replace my Glock 42 and there's two guns that I'm looking at. Uh, one is the C SIG P365 and the other one is the uh, Springfield Hellcat. So I've got these guns back and I'm doing a extensive review because again, this is for me uh, because I'm picking a new uh, ha new handgun. And you'll be seeing a video coming up where we talk about the 365 versus the, uh, the Hellcat and what my decision is and, and why. But I wanna go over the SIG P365 and the P365 SAS. SIG introduced the P365 in 2018. This pistol was a game changer. Uh, this was the epitome of what you would want is a carry concealed weapon with a size having a magazine capacity of 10, 12, and 15 rounds, depending on the magazine you went with. Your 10 rounds for your uh, your easy conceal, 12 round, then even 15 rounds. So you have three different options for magazines. And for as far as it's, uh, all of its dimensions, this thing was smaller than the Glock 26, carried the same amount of firepower, and was much, was much more concealable. So uh, SIG really hit it out of the ballpark with this one, and they offered also the P365 uh, SAS, which we're gonna go over in a few minutes. But uh, one of the first things I wanna discuss is, when this pistol first came out, there were some complaints about some issues with firing pins breaking and firing pin drag. Well, I wanna to talk to you about what firing pin drag is because uh, I happen to have quite a bit of experience with this, not just from a uh, mechanical, uh, mecha you know, mechanical aspects of it, but also forensics. So I want to talk to you about what firing pin drag is. Firing pin drag is a perfectly normal phenomenon. Now, let's go back to my days in forensics. Uh, during my days in forensics, we obviously looked at hundreds of thousands of, of images of breech face marks on cartridge cases. And we saw firing pin drags. Firing pin drags are indicative of a specific operating mechanism on a pistol. The Browning linkless or linked uh, Type of a type of mechanism causes the drag. Now, when the slide moves rearward, you'll see how the barrel drops down. The firing pin drag we use it as a class characteristic uh, in forensics. This would let us know what type of a class of firearms that we were looking for, because the drag was caused specifically by the Browning linkless or linked type mechanism, which required the barrel to drop down we would be able to say, well, if we have cartridge cases, say I have 10 cartridge cases and uh, I match them all up and they all have uh, a drag on it. And I get a call from a police officer says, I have a suspect gun here. And I'd be able to say to him, well, what kind of gun is he? He goes, well, I got a Breda 92F. No, that's not the gun we're looking for. Because the Breda 92F, due to the fact that it uses a siltating block, the slide goes right uh, goes right to the rear and it does not move the, the breech face on the cartridge case. It doesn't move anything. So there is no drag, and there's also some other things that would make it unique. But because of that, because of that lack of drag, and because I can tell what the operating mechanism it is, I can totally eliminate it. So degrees of drag. Well, there's a lot of things that affect that. Uh, the way the firing pin is, uh, if the firing pin has a very heavy uh, spring, which causes it to recoil, that can make it a little bit less. The smaller the pistol is, the higher velocity of the slide, generally the heavier the drag you're going to get. Now, this drag does not affect the firing pin. It is not a mechanical issue. It's not going to cause any problems whatsoever. Now, we get to the SIG. There's been a lot of mis mis uh, misinformation out there that people say that it was caused by the firing pin drag. The firing pin's breaking. No, it was not. From a mechanical aspect, what would cause that firing pin to break is a, is a, is a lack of heat treating properly. Uh, more than likely, it was too, br it was too brutal, uh, and the firing pin actually would snap. So... This was a very limited number of SIG pistols that did experience this, but uh, a lot of people had claimed that it was because of the drag. No, it was not. The drag is a completely normal. If you were to look at a breech, the breech face marks of a M1911 uh, Glock, uh, even though Glock has a different shaped firing pin, you see the the, the drag. Um, SIG, the SIG, SIG 226s and all that, you will see drag. Now, sometimes you'll have the drag obscured because, again, as the, as the barrel unlocks and it drops down, the primer uh, can scrape up against the breech face, and as the breech face goes down, it causes those striations or those, those uh, scrapes that we call shear. And sometimes that shear can, uh, can obstruct the drag, uh, and sometimes it doesn't. But those are things, once you start looking at these under a microscope, you start seeing, and all this stuff starts to correlate of how these guns work. 
So if we see a drag, we know we're not looking for a Brightco, Lorston, or Jennings because they have stationary firing pins and they, and they they are basically a blowback operation. We know they're not a Beretta because the Beretta doesn't doesn't drop down; it just has an oscillating block. So we know the specific class of firearms that we are we are looking at. So I see a lot of people on the on the forums who say, oh, because of those uh, those few issues with the broken firing pins, you know, I don't want to go near the, the P365. It's it's defective. No, it's not. Uh, Stig had an issue with uh, with with firing pins uh, being heat treated improperly. That's what caused the problem, and it was very minimum, and they and they, and they corrected it. Now, also people will say, well, we see uh, Stig has changed their firing pins. Well, as you go through, you do you do make improvements on things. Um, they can make it so it's lighter, uh, so it's less. Because once you get people who are who are telling you that this this issue is because of a of a mechanical failure on their part, now they're going to try to eliminate more of the shear because people seem to uh, you say that it, it's 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 relevant to that failure. So my guess is is they made some modifications to the firing pin, so they made the uh, the firing pin lighter, uh, so it was less likely to leave that drag or as heavy of a drag. But still, if you were to look at it under a microscope, you would still see that that drag is there. So. Uh, you know anybody who who wants to use that as a reason why they don't want to go with the P365? That's not realistic. That was a there was a small batch. No matter you know I work with many 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 gun manufacturers. No matter how good the manufacturer is, you always have bad parts that go out, especially when it comes to something like heat treating, which is probably done you know externally. It's not done in house. These things do happen. I don't care if it's Sig, Beretta, HK, Glock. All of them have had recalls at one at one point or another because of problems. But the issue was was handled. So that was the only complaint anybody ever had had about the P365, and it was something that was very preliminary, and it was really something that was irrelevant. Um, there's no correlation between the firing pins breaking and the drag. That was a problem with the firing pin not being uh, manufactured properly. So first of all, I want to talk about the P365. Uh, this is the particular pistol that I'm that I'm considering here. When you're looking at the dimensions, you're looking at the caliber, of course, nine by nineteen, and the gun that I'm looking to replace is my my uh, Glock the 42, which is a 380. You have a 3.1 inch barrel length with an overall length of 5.8 inches, the width of just one inch, height of 4.3 inches. Now the magazine capacity, as we've already talked about, was 10, 12, and 15 rounds. The sights, you have a uh, tritium night sights, and you have your standard three dot system. You have a weight of 18 ounces, a very, very light gun with an MSRP of 529. Now taking a look at the gun, you see we, we have very slim line. Uh, some of the things we want to point out again, we have the sights, we have the three dot sight system with Trigicon night sights. You will notice right here we do have a loaded chamber indicator. So, I mean, you know, it's a very small window. You may need a flashlight to see it, but you'll be able to see a cartridge case that was in the chamber. On the left side, you'll see we have the a very slimline slide stop or slide release. We have this is something latch release lever, and we also have a reversible magazine release, which is fairly oversized as well. Very thin. Now, one of the things that I had added to this was the TLR6. Now, uh, when I decided I want to go with it, concealed handgun. I, I did want to have the opportunity to have a flashlight as well as a laser. Uh, now we'll talk a little about what the TLR6 is. Now you have a 100 lumens. Now this is a very small LED uh, for its size, so 100 lumens is excellent. Now for as far as a self-defense gun, you're only looking at something between 6 to 10 feet. Uh, this is plenty for that. Uh, obviously you, you have much better uh, flashlights that go to 1,000 lumens. Not necessary for a small carry concealed gun like this, and plus the size is, uh, where size counts. For batteries, you have two of the CR1-3 uh, and lithium batteries. It takes two of them. Now, for as far as the beam distance, you're looking at about 89 meters on it. You have a maximum candelabra at 2,000. Now, the length is only 2.2 inches, and it is light as hell at 1.12 inches. Now, we also have a laser. The laser aiming module has three options. You have first is just the light, then you have just the laser, then you have light and laser combination, so you can go with all different, all three that you like. Now the laser is a 640 to 660 nanometer. It's more of an orangish red uh, light, which is very consistent. Now I want to talk a little bit about why I wanted the laser on there. When I started off my career, uh, I started off working for a company called Laser Max. I'm sure most of you have heard of them. They have the internal guide rod lasers. And we did, I did some work in development. I did some of the work in uh, test and evaluation. I also did some work in marketing. And one of the things that we found with a laser is, and we found from police officers who had sent us letters, is the fact that the lasers had prevented them from having to shoot. Because having a red dot on you is a universal uh, language that tells you that whatever you're doing, you better stop or something very, very bad is about to happen. So sometimes by having that laser pointed at the target, that's, that can basically de-escalate a situation and prevent the shooting from having to happen. 
And we've had several evidence of that happening with police officers who would send us in, uh, uh, you know, testimonials of how that laser stopped them from being able to shoot. Now, they're also very good for accuracy. Uh, these are adjustable for both windage and elevation at seven yards, which I have this at. So if you had to fire from the hip with just a laser, you'd be able to do it and you'd be able to hit the target uh, perfectly. Uh, so it can do that as well. But it gives you a lot of flexibility and gives you a lot of opportunity because a lot of your self-defense conditions are generally going to be at night as well, especially if you're walking to a bank or you're walking to, you know, for, you know, to, a, to your car at night or whatever. The, la the light will help you. Uh, and the laser can as well. So I, I like having the option of having both of those. So both the, uh, the SIG P365 and the Hellcat, both models that I was testing, had this particular thing on it. So we'll take a, look, take a closer look at the pistol for disassembly. Now we do have a striker fired pistol. The trigger on this is absolutely gorgeous. I have to say for any of the small caliber uh, CCW pistols or the smaller pistols, this definitely has the nicest trigger that I have, I have seen. Now my Glock 42 that I'm replacing uh, you know, one of these guns with, that trigger is absolutely horrid. Uh, I own many, many Glocks and that trigger uh, is the worst. The Glock, the Glock pistol I had because of how brutal that, target, that trigger was, I was unable to get very good groups at all, even at six to 10 yards. Now that was probably was unique to that particular pistol uh, because that's the only Glock I've ever had that was like that, but that still was one of the issues I had come across. Now, for as far as safeties are concerned, this is your typical P365, P320. There is no manual safety. However, there is a model available if you so chose to have a manual safety on here. I did not. This has the most important safety of all is the firing pin safety, which prevents the pistol from being able to be fired until the trigger is pulled all the way to the rear. It also has basically a drop type safety, which the trigger also has to be pulled to the rear so that it will release the striker. Now, disassembly, very simple. Again, make sure that's empty. We're going to lock it open to the rear. Once disassembly latches down, we replace, we release the slide to go forward. Then we have our slide and our frame. Now looking at the frame, very simplistic. You have a full size, you have a full rail on here. Uh, very, very simplistic, very, very light. And you also can go with different modules on here if you would like. For as far as the slide's concerned, a, a dual recoil spring assembly. And you can see in here, we do have our passive firing pin block right here. And we have our barrel. So we have a very, very simple pistol. Machining is precision, what you would expect from SIG. Reassembly, we drop it right back in place. We drop the spring guide back into place. Back on the frame. And flip our, flip our something latch just over back up, and there we have it. That's all there is to it. Now we want to take a look at the P365 SAS. Basically what SIG has done is they have removed the rear sights, and they've replaced it with the FT Bullseye fiber optic sight. So as you can see, we have fiber optics on here, and you also, you also have tritium in there. Now, when you look through the rear, which you're going to see a photograph on here, you're going to see a holograph of two circles, uh, and they're green. And that's very, very highly, highly bright, especially during the daytime. During the, during the night hours, it's not so much, but there is one really, really bad part about having this sight. It, the FT Bullseye, uh, this sight is not adjustable. The, what you get is what you get. Uh, now, in fact, with this particular pistol, when I put it off of a, off of a rest, you'll see from the target that'll be coming up in the shooting portion of it, you'll see that I was shooting high to the right. But unfortunately, there's no way to, to adjust that. So it is picked up very, you know, very, you do pick it up very, very easily. However, uh, this was a, I, I had difficulty with this. I had difficulty getting used to it, uh, pulling it up and getting it where it needs to be. I shot much better with the uh, with the, with the standard sights that I did with this. This was a very interesting option. Now, also one of the options that we had also had uh, flutes on here. So basically, you had a porting up. Well, that porting, as you'll see from another photograph, you'll see makes it a fire breathing dragon. When you fire this thing in the dark, it lights up the room quite a bit. So I don't think uh, you know, having the porting on it's a very good idea. Uh, you also have anti-snag. There's nothing on here. There's no sharp edges. There's nothing. If you look at the slide stop, it's virtually gone. It's, it's very much recessed into the frame. This is something like release lever is now basically a screw. You're going to need a cartridge case to, to rotate that, to disassemble it. So everything has been streamlined, so it's anti-snag. So if it was to go in a holster or in a pocket, you'd be able to draw it out very, very quickly. All the other features on it are the exact same with your uh, loaded, car loaded chamber indicators. Uh, everything else is basically the same between the two pistols. The, ma the major difference is the, the, the sight systems on here and a little bit uh, more of the edges are broken off, but that's pretty much it. 
But I want to take a look at both of these uh, to see which one I had liked better. And there's pretty much no question that the one that I preferred was the standard with the three with the three dot sights. The next thing we wanted to look at was how we were, we were going to carry these pistols. Well, the way that I tend to like to carry these pistols, I like uh, for a compact pistol to be an inside the uh, pocket or a pocket holster. And the ones that we looked at were the recluse holsters. Now, first off, when it came to the P365 with the TLR6, this became an issue because this was relatively new and there wasn't too many companies that made holsters. The first one was the, that I found that was commercially available or was made by Dara. It was in the waistband holster, and this took the, uh, the gun with the TLR6 on it. It was relatively difficult to pull out, and again, being here in Texas, it's much easier for me to throw something in my pocket. Now, the recluse holsters, on the other hand, the recluse holsters I've been, I was quite fond of. Um, and at first, uh, they, they, I was not having an option for the TLR6, but without it, there's a couple options. The first one was the standard pocket holster, where we just drop it in like so, and we just drop it in your pocket. There's no printing, there's nothing on here. There's another one that was pretty neat, where we could take a spare magazine, drop the spare magazine in there, and then drop the gun. So you were able to carry safely with the trigger held, held in place by, by a notch in there, so the trigger can't move, and a spare magazine. So we had that. So this was an awesome option as well. However, my issue was I wanted the TLR6 on it. So I contacted Recluse. Now, since this is, was relatively new, they didn't have it, but the gentleman over at Recluse was able to make one for me that would take the TLR6. And this was absolutely perfect. He had also made one of these for me for the Springfield Hellcat, which we're going to be going over in the next video. So I was able to carry both pistols uh, in, in the pocket and to see how I liked it better. This was by far my favorite option. Uh, this was this was perfect. It fit in the pocket. It was easy to be able to get to, get to it. You just put your hands on the side, and it would pull right out uh, inside the inside the pocket. Now uh, with this one here with the Dara. Dara, it clamps on really, really tight, and even when you try to adjust the screws here, it was still relatively tight. You would have to have a good heavy belt on there to be able to pull that out. The pocket holster was a little bit easier. Now, there's a couple other companies that did uh, manufacture something that would take the TLR6. Uh, they were not very cooperative to send me uh, you know, samples to let me take a look at to show you. But uh, the reality was, was I knew what I was looking for was it was a pocket holster, and Recluse took care of everything. Now, those of you who do have these pistols with the uh, TLR6s, Give Recluse a call. He can make them for you. They're like that for any gun. Again, he made it for both this and for the uh, the Hellcat. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to take this gun to the range. We're going to see how both of them shoot. Now, recoil was very, very pleasant for these, for these guns being as small as they are. Um, due to the fact that these were, I was looking at these for defense guns, we put well over 1,000 rounds, uh, well, closer, closer to 1,500 rounds out of this model here. And the P365 SAS, that probably only put maybe a couple hundred through it because, again, the sights, I found out very quickly that it just wasn't what I was looking for in sights. I, I felt that I was much better off with the, with the three-dot 
the trigger on them was absolutely excellent. Now, when you look at small guns today, I think what the reality is, uh, I don't think you're going to find anything better than the P365 and the Hellcat. I think those are two of the finest, most compact, high-capacity guns that you're going to be able to carry. And uh, that's why we, that's why, you know, that's why I chose these. And uh, quite frankly, taking a look at the P365 and the Hellcat, I'm having one heck of a time deciding which one I want to go with. Uh, but you're going to have to wait for the next video for that. So, for as far as the P365 is concerned, the initial reports of the uh, the damaged firing pins that's long gone. That was a very single. That was a single batch of uh, of firing pins that were the cause, and it was not caused by the drag. As we saw, the drag is a normal phenomenon that comes out of a, a pistol with a Browning uh, linkless or linked system where your barrel drops down. That's normal. Uh, as we said before, the degree of it is different uh, depending on the uh, the weight of the firing pin and the use of a spring. It's but overall it's relevant. The firing pin is not damaged by it. Uh, it's normal. Um, even on ammunition, uh, if you were to look at cartridge cases, depending on how soft the primer is. Uh, you'll see a deeper drag mark than others. Uh, you know, you see a federal pri federal primer, which is pretty much uh, one, of the, one of the softest ones out there. You'll generally see it more. Uh, some of the more military hard primers, you'll see maybe a little bit less, but it is there. Uh, and in forensics, we use it as a class characteristic. You know, if we if we saw that drag, we were able to eliminate by seeing that drag entire other classes of pistols that utilized a. Uh, a, you know, a direct blowback or or facilitating uh, block, we were able to completely say, you know, we're not looking for that. We, you know, we definitely don't need a Beretta. We need a gun that has a Browning uh, link. Also, we even used it uh, uh, as a way to index our cartridge cases on a microscope too. The, you know, the drag was always at three o'clock, but it's that's a phenomenon that we see on a regular basis. It was extremely common, and it was a class characteristic for us, uh, and it is normal. And from a manufacturing standpoint. It's always been there. It's been there since the 1911, since you know, since he created the the uh, the dropping barrel locking mechanism. It's always been there, and you do see it uh, on most pistols to this day with it. So, um, if you're looking at these pistols, I would not be using that as any kind of a, a gauge on whether the gun's any good or not, because that's not the case. Any pistol you could have an issue with, uh, you know, you know, you know, with a brittle firing pin or something that wasn't uh, done properly in heat treat. Uh, they caught that and they have that uh, taken care of now. Uh, anybody who's had any of the newer guns, you know, you know, after the first year, uh, I've never heard of, any, of it being a problem. And there's several guys who've done who've done thousands of rounds of endurance tests on it. Uh, again, we're looking at close to 1,500 rounds on on this gun here, and this has been 100% reliable with every type of ammunition that I put in it. Uh, so I'm very confident that uh, this pistol would be an excellent self-defense gun. But uh, I do look forward to uh, doing the next video with we do the comparison and I finally make my decision on which one it's going to be. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share.